us and thank you to the prospective students. We know this is a very long day for you, um, but we've all enjoyed getting to know you today. I just want to, as a reminder for everyone, a little bit about some of the upcoming FMI events um, this semester and um, tell you, for those of you who don't know as much about the Francis McClellan Institute, we are named after Francis McClellan, who is really um, stood for resilience her entire life and was a staunch advocate for creating opportunities for all individuals to reach their full potential. Our goal is really to support innovative interdisciplinary research aimed at improving the lives of children, youth, and families, and to share that research and to build collaborations with people who are working in the community in order to improve the lives of children, youth, and families. Please follow us. Um, you can hear about the work that we're doing, the work that all of our graduate students are doing, our faculty are doing, um, and really about the bridges that we're building with the community. And today we have um, the FSHD faculty and affiliated faculty and friends are going to be presenting, and this is a really hard task for if you know, faculty, we really like to talk about our research. We can talk about our research for a long time at great depth. And that's not what we can do today. So we have five minutes. Ali and Gianna are going to be keeping time in the back. We have, they're going to be waving signs, hopefully not frantically at you. So um, we really do want to stay um, on schedule here. So five minutes to speed through your slides. And then, of course, um, following this, thanks to Michelle Walsh, we'll be having a potluck at her house where you will welcome to have further in-depth conversations with everyone. Um, so go ahead and get started then by introducing Dr. Sabrina Helm. Yay. Good afternoon, everybody. A pleasure to see you. It's not over yet. No, don't wait. Don't stop. <laughs> so um, you might ask yourself, why is an odd bird like me? I'm in retailing and consumer science is actually talking about you know, their research here. It's going to be clear here in a second. Yeah? So um, there's no news value in uh, the fact that we're in a climate emergency, right? You've probably all heard about that, right? So I let you read this statement here. Greta Thunberg. I just talked about her twice today and in my talk. Very good. You did well. <laughs> All right. So note that this is a statement she made uh, uh, last year. So you can substitute the one number 10 already by nine. All right. So we have about nine, nine uh, years to make fundamental changes. Yeah? Um, so here's the point why I'm talking about this topic. Um, Overconsumption is the main driver of climate change. Overconsumption and overpopulation, and those are based on decision making by individuals. So that's what we all research, right? And from a consumer perspective, you know, or a consumer scientist perspective, um, there's also a lot to be learned from why certain cultures consume so much, as particularly our culture um, does. Yeah. So it's estimated that if everybody consumed, such as Americans, we would need five planet Earth to sustain our needs. We currently do not have five Earths. We do have the option to go to Mars, but if you are interested actually in the quality of life and well-being of most people currently around us and the future generations, that is not an option. We are not gonna be there in time to really make a difference. So technology is not gonna save us. Um, from an academic perspective, dealing with climate change is uh, somewhat interesting and challenging. Um, I'm going to point that out to, to all of you because you will be in academia, whether you're going to be here or somewhere else, but you have to realize certain things about, you know, dealing with controversial research topics. Yeah? Generally at universities, we do very incremental kind of studies and progress. We look at, you know, peer reviewed research and how much citations we get. That's not going to change the world. Yeah? Your peers reading your articles are not going to change the world. Um, Research on climate change has to be transdisciplinary. There's no way around it. Any work on sustainability has to be transdisciplinary. That's hard work, but it's also really interesting. Um, most of us who are probably in this room are more like introverts and don't necessarily like going out there and talking to everybody. Yeah, that can be a challenge. It can also be rewarding to do that. We really need to do that in order to have an impact. Um, last point here, yeah, dealing with climate change is kind of frightening. Yeah? We don't like that. Humans generally build up proximal defenses as soon as something uh, untoward happens and they don't like you know, being exposed to a threatening kind of information. Yeah? So we have to overcome that too in, in, in order to make a difference in, in our research. Yeah, um, but again, why do I do that? And why am I inviting everybody else to look at climate change in their research as well? Here, because of this. Yeah? 
there really is a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, what are my current research projects that might be of interest of you if you are here or if you plan to come here and would like to um, work on that uh, in these kind of areas? Yeah, um, I'm interested in better understanding the mental health effects of climate change. And that means climate change as a pre-traumatic stressor. That means we all currently, if we are exposed to media coverage on climate change, if we hear all this frightening news, we are already in a state of agitation. Yeah? For a lot of people, that is decreasing their well-being. We already have increased suicidal rates and so forth because a lot of people start getting really worried. So particularly in vulnerable populations, this is starting to be a big issue. Um, you've probably heard that we have a climate, uh, that we have a uh, mental health crisis, particularly also on university campuses. So, so this is going to be a big topic. It's also a big topic if you're interested in children. How can we actually support our children who are growing up in an environment that's going to look very different to what they see today? Yeah. So um, helping children so that they are not uh, going to be the generation of being totally freaked out is a fundamental topic that we need to work on. Um, I'm also conducting a study on climate change and the choice to be child-free. There's people who already made the decision not going to have kids because what's going to, what's the sense in all of it? Very, very frightening kinds of considerations. Yeah. Um, so from the perspective of parenting, there's a lot that we need to do in terms of preparing people um, for the impending changes that we won't have. Because there's hopefully yeah, going to be hope instead of fear. Um, and I'm interested in how to teach about climate change. I said here to avoid the worst, meaning A, that nobody is going to be listening to the messages that we try to convey in getting people to start adapting to climate change. And also the worst, meaning while we teach, we need to be very considerate about how we teach about climate change. Always noting that there's a lot that can be done so that we use those nine years very fruitfully so that in fact, uh, humanity has a good chance. Yeah? So climate news, needs to overcome um, all these hurdles so that there is going to be um, a future generation that has it in their identity already to um, cope with climate change productively. So what I'm looking at is trying to get people to face what's going on. I incorporate that in my research so that we can fight and face the problems instead of reacting by freeze or flight mechanisms that humans are prone to do. And all my topics that I presented here were looking at. Anybody is interested in learning more about this? Here are my contact details. Thank you very much. Here. Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm Diane, Debbie Curley, um, is who you see on your agenda. Um, I'm Diane Manzini, I'm the program coordinator for the Family Engagement Program. Debbie is the faculty who runs the program, uh, the Cooperative Extension, and our focus is on giving parents and caregivers the tools they need to help their children succeed in life. Um, so we really like this quote that goes along with what we do. It's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. So in parenting, we believe it's the key to this, and early childhood is where that foundation is built. So here is some incarceration data. As some of you guys might know, the U.S. incarcerates more people than any other country. By age 17, half of youth in foster care have been arrested, have been convicted, or have spent a night in some sort of correctional facility. And while there's a lot of factors that go into incarceration rates, we focus on family and what parents can do to help their children succeed in life as their first teachers and just have such a huge impact on their child's brain development. Um, so 34% of parents in Pima County and 11% of top Arizona believe learning is pretty much set from birth and cannot be really changed by the way parents interact with their kids. That's false. <laughs> um, so this kind of shows the brain development, which um, dependent on experiences over the kid's life for the first six years, about 90% of a child's brain is developed by the age that they're five. Um, and here is, uh, on the left, that's the brain of a normal child. On the right, that's a sensory deprived child. And that difference is that normal child has their basic needs met. They have a loving, stable relationship with their parents and caregivers, and they have a wide variety of 
um, experiences that help them. So this is kind of a sad number, 9,213. That's the number of cases of child with maltreatment that were reported in Pima County in the course of just one year. So what does our program offer? We do a lot of classes out in the community for parents. We do topics like child behavior management, um, brain development, positive discipline. We also have some fun classes where the kids get to come and learn about nutrition and gardening through interactive activities with their parents. Um, so last year we had 120 workshops, we served 887 caregivers and children, and we have a bunch of great data from that. In our Stepping Stones class, that was for parents and children with autism, there was a great decrease in stress and depression and anxiety in the parents, and over just the six-week period, there was a 11% drop in child misbehavior during their class. Uh, we also teach some classes in the prisons, and that gives these guys a lot of hope that they can be better parents in the future. Um, we have data that we give these guys parental knowledge tests, and at the start, they scored about a 37%, and at the end, they, they scored 96% on average. It's a big difference. And overall, we saw an increase of 53% in parental knowledge from all of our tests. Um, we kind of stress the stages of behavior change, where we teach, we teach these parents knowledge and tools, and then we encourage them to figure out what ones they want to implement in, their, in themselves and their children. Um, and then there's also some great long-term effects in investing in childhood, um, early childhood. That for every dollar spent in preschool, four dollars, eight dollars is saved in social services. <clears throat> this is we're able to do these classes pretty much free here in the community, and that's thanks to First Things First. They're a state agency that supports families with kids age zero to five. Um, and we also collaborate a lot with other local agencies here in town. We're part of what's called the Pima County Parenting Coalition. And together we kind of reach as many families as we can and we create visibility that these are offered. A lot of people don't know there's free education here in the community. Um, and hope to get more parents and help more families. Have fun. <laughs> Oh, did another, did you have oh, more to say? <laughs> ah, here we go, okay. Hi everyone, I'm Dan McDonald and I'm an area agent and regional specialist with Cooperative Extension. Many of you don't know what Cooperative Extension is, I would imagine. Um, Diane described some of the parenting program that we have in the community. But basically what we're doing is outreach in the community, all right? So we're taking Research that's done in places like this by lovely faculty members over here, translating it into something that's relevant and needed in the um, community in the form of programming. So we have parenting, early childhood. I also do, I supervise a nutrition, nutrition program. But today I'm gonna to talk about a financial education um, program that we have, not just here in Pima County, we actually have offices throughout the state in every single county. And so I'm going to describe what we have going on for a pilot program that we've been doing just over really uh, not quite a year yet around financial education. Um, a little background. So we do a needs assessment several years ago. We did a statewide needs assessment on the priorities that our stakeholders identified um, of needs in the community. And financial education was the second most frequently endorsed um, area of need. Uh, the top one was nutrition education. So we knew that we had very little going on in extension for financial education. We knew we needed to do something, but what? So we did, again, um, we worked with Take Charge America Institute, which is located here in the North School, actually right down the hall. Noel Wilkinson is a program coordinator there. Um, we worked with um, Take Charge America Institute to do an asset scan of the state realized, and not surprisingly, that rural counties, rural areas were the ones that really had the most gaps in terms of resources around that. We also knew we had to address the debt load um, that Arizona residents were um, holding and the um, financial management, money management that they needed. So based on all of that, we partnered with Take Charge America Institute um, and with Cooperative Extension Working Group, which is really about a dozen or so faculty and other professionals around the state involved in this area. We were able last year, last um, spring actually, 
um, to get funding, um, about 140,000 plus TCAI uh, was able to um, give us some money to help support program coordinator here. And then by that, we were able to reach a number of counties. So we're in Cochise, Gila, Pinal, La Paz, we're actually in Yuma County too. Notice Pima is not on that. We're, we're not on the list, but we're centered here and working out in those counties providing support. We wanted to make sure that as we develop these programs, and you'll notice we have, we have this iterative process. We're piloting things, we're putting it out in the community, but taking back information so that we're sure we're culturally relevant, we're meeting the needs, meeting our uh, clientele where they are. Okay, so we have, we meet once a month, we have Zoom meetings, and Noel and the instructional specialists out there give us feedback on, on how we're doing. We chose, um, the working group chose two curricula, one's light touch, where does your money go? I'll explain that a little bit more momentarily. And then a, a more intensive four uh, week series, once a week, four times series, building financial um, security. Uh, one is from Purdue, the other is from Rutgers, and we adapted things. And really with that second one, we did a lot of adaptations as we um, went along based on the feedback we were receiving. Where does your money go? Light touch, really just an introduction for people to start thinking about their, their money, how they're using it, what's their values around money, what's some of the uh, terminology, um, but to get them thinking, maybe a hook to go on to more um, intensive um, um, interventions. Building financial security, this is um, basically two to two and a half hours, uh, four times. Okay, so people come back week after week, this is doing that introduction again, but then really getting much more intensive and really having people practice, okay, so that they can go home, put some things together, think about it, talk about it with their families, come back and report on what they're doing, get support um, from others um, and understand what some of these things are and maybe start doing them um, in their own financial um, well-being. Okay, so um, the evaluation, we basically took the canned evaluation um, we weren't totally satisfied with it. The one, the, the, the um, light touch, we're okay. We found out that people were actually thinking on post uh, test. They're thinking about their expenses. They're able to identify where some of the leaks are in terms of uh, some of the spending that they have going on and do something about it. We were really dissatisfied with the um, evaluation that we had for the more intensive one. And so that's what we're working on. So I'm gonna get right to it graduate students, um, things that we need help on have to do with um, coming up with some fact sheets first, the materials that we use, maybe apps that Noel's helping to develop so we can take the research and make materials that are really useful for our clientele that we're working uh, with. Next steps have to do with translating to Spanish um, as well as getting funding so that we can sustain our programming and keep this guy uh, going turn. that's it thank you oh thanks to the people that work and this is part of the working group and the many folks that we're working with including um tori ligan and rick rosen here as part of take charge america institute thank you so as melissa said the faculty like to talk a lot and so rather than and cut down on everything I want to say I'm just going to say it really fast okay, so hang on I'm going to cancel that I need to watch myself too all right so I lead the community research evaluation and development team here in the Norton School uh, Rachel is new and we have not had a chance to get <laughs> uh, she's part of our team and these are um, a team of, of professional staff who come with a, a lot of different backgrounds from psychology, history, uh, public health, education, uh, higher ed. And we bring this very diverse range of perspectives to the kind of community-based work that we're doing. Uh, we don't actually have a specific content area. Rather, we have a broader goal of taking and leveraging social science research to solve social problems. And we do that through these are our guiding principles. So we focus on these and especially the idea of leveraging the university 
uh, resources and service to the community. And you've heard a lot um, about how we're doing that here throughout the day. We do this by working with a wide range of community partners from uh, mostly across the state from and we we're from the Pima County Attorney's Office to the Intertribal Council of Arizona and um, with some of the others all the way up to and including uh, the folks who image the first black hole. So we have a, a pretty wide range of work that we do. One of our key partners is First Things First, who you've just heard about around early childhood. And our team works to support them in collecting a number, this, um, our secondary data for statewide reports that we do that show the health of, the, of children and their families across Arizona and at the state and the county level. And it shows how things have changed over time and when there are various uh, county variations in uh, health and well-being of families of with young children. We also work um, at more of the local and regional community kinds of level to do uh, regional needs and assets that are more community focused. And in that work, we work primarily in the rural areas of the state, including with all the tribes that participate with First Things First. And these reports gather secondary and some primary data around a number of uh, health and wellness indicators that give the local volunteer-led councils information to make some decisions about the kinds of strategies they use to spend over $125 million a year that First Things First provides in services uh, for uh, families with young children. And this familiarity with the early childhood data across uh, the state has really, uh, we've been able to leverage that in some additional work, including looking at where child care deserts are in Pima County and looking not just at accessibility of child care based on geography, but also accessibility based on the uh, cost of child care and uh, some of the other factors like uh, transportation to access it and whatnot. We've also worked closely with the Women's Foundation of Southern Arizona then to look at what supports uh, working single mothers might need as far as education and child care and where are their uh, opportunities in employment that they could take advantage of and what are the best practices for supporting them in getting through career and technical education. That's the kind of policy relevant work we really like and it's very exciting to us that they have Women's Foundation have taken that basic work that we did for them and uh, are now piloting an intervention that provides tuition and childcare and other wraparound services for single moms in the community to get <laughs> career and technical education. And we're now partnering with them to evaluate that program. A huge part of our work is capacity building for uh, evaluation with cooperative extension. And we provide the sort of training and background uh, supports needed for a lot of the folks that you've heard talking here today uh, to help give them the tools that they need. Uh, we work with 4-H, the positive youth development uh, and around adolescents to uh, look at how well their programming is mapping onto their theoretical idea of what are the um, pieces that need to, youth need to thrive and have positive outcomes. We are working to develop a common system, <laughs> 30 seconds uh, <laughs> for evaluation across the state that will give them um, evaluation tools that we can aggregate across the state uh, and to put in their hands materials to help tell their stories in innovative data viz ways. We're working with all the elements of cooperative extension to try to pull those data statewide including many of the areas that you've just uh, heard talking about. Uh, again, trying to develop systems. So if you're really interested in how to you know, collect data in accessible ways, we do that. There's more work that we do, lots and lots and lots of work around health and wellness and collective impact models in communities. Uh, and we work nationally as well. This was some work that we did that looked at best practice for involving uh, youth of color in some of the positive youth development programs uh, around the country that 4-H supplies. So again, there are plenty of opportunities to be involved in this very community engaged work, both um, secondary data and how to present that well, and opportunities to work deeply and um, very satisfyingly. 
better word, in community uh, and in partnership with them. So thank you very much. And uh, running away a little early just so I can get my house tidy. <laughs> I had left my son in charge of that. <laughs> Hello, I'm Ross Toomey. I'm going to be talking about uh, a sort of a new, newer area uh, for me uh, in doing research. Um, and so um, first, I just wanted to start off with why I do research. Why am I a professor? Um, and this quote by Adrian Rich uh, puts it all uh, into one quote. So when someone with the authority of a teacher, say, describes the world and you are not in it, there is a moment of psychic disequilibrium as if you looked into a mirror and saw nothing. And so as a transgender college student looking at the literature, there was like absolutely nothing written uh, especially from a positive framework, um, as I was when I was a college student, uh, and so I wanted to change that. Um, and so my research is inherently action-based and action-oriented, um, so that these types of situations don't happen for other uh, people. Uh, and so my work really uh, tries to move from just a surviving mentality for LGBTQ youth uh, populations to helping them to be in a thriving uh, situation. My research is mostly grounded in and framed by the minority stress framework, which really takes away kind of the way that LGBT populations have been described um, throughout history and research as being uh, their sexuality or their gender as a reason for the mental health disparities that we see, but rather than placing the onus um, on systems of oppression in society as the uh, culprit for why we see uh, mental health disparities, um, as well as physical health and uh, behavioral health and academic disparities. Most of my work today uh, in the past five years has moved to uh, informing prevention and actually starting to deliver prevention efforts so that we can translate science into action and, and actually help uh, youth thrive. Uh, and so my research has taken uh, both an individual level approach as well as a systems level approach, focusing on both um, policies, law, professional development, opportunities, uh, representation, on the system side and then individual side thinking about coping strategies and uh, work with a museum, for example, on arts engagement to help reduce suicide behaviors among LGBT young people. Uh, so I actually just found out that we, uh, my collaborator and I got a grant funded from the NCAA. Uh, and so uh, our project is uh, that's coming up is called Ready, Set, Gay, uh, Sexual and Gender Minority Prejudice in College Athletics. Uh, and so we think that sports is the last frontier, right? So like when we think about homophobia, when we think about transphobia, where else is it more concentrated than this super masculine environment of sports, uh, particularly team sports. Um, and so, uh, and actually just a, a caveat, we, we know from our own research that women's sports are actually more homophobic and more transphobic than men's sports are because they're not only violating sexuality norms, they're violating gender and sexuality. Uh, and so just to make sure everybody knows, it's not just men. Uh, and so uh, there have been several recent uh, examples of uh, out gay and bisexual men, uh, uh, college athletes, including here at Arizona. We actually had the first, it's not well known, but we had the first uh, NCAA Division I out gay man as a football recruit um, two years ago to the U of A. Uh, and so we're starting to see more representation. What we don't know is what their experience is. I can tell you, um, not from research, but that the experience of some of these men uh, has not been positive. Uh, and so our pilot study, we looked at um, two universities and we looked at how often, what were players reporting in terms of LGBTQ bias on the, on the playing field, in the locker room and outside the locker room. Uh, and so while we saw that um, it wasn't uh, a lot of folks who were uh, saying that they were often hearing negative slurs or uh, seeing overt types of bias, um, it still was over 65% who had experienced at least sometimes hearing anti-LGBT remarks in the playing field. Uh, and these were both division <coughs> one um, schools as well. Uh, and unfortunately though, when you look at, you see that many people reporting, those many athletes reporting that they were hearing anti-LGBTQ slurs while participating in college athletics, um, about only 35% of them report actually intervening in that bias. So they're seeing it, they're witnessing it, but yet they're not reporting that they're intervening and trying to stop that bias from happening. When we asked them in the open-ended, uh, it was a mixed method study, so when we asked them why they weren't intervening, uh, they said it's not a big deal. 
it doesn't matter to me. Oh my gosh, one minute. Um, I don't know what I, I want to, but I don't know what to say. So we don't teach people how to intervene in, in bias um, across the board, um, not even just specific to sexuality or gender. I want to, but I'm afraid the attack will turn on me. Uh, so that, that piece of being a, an athlete of, if I say something, they're gonna think I'm gay. And that's the reason I said something, so then they're going to attack. Uh, so we're using the theory of planned behavior to try to address this, uh, where we know that uh, both uh, personal beliefs, social norms, and knowledge uh, of how to intervene should uh, relate to intent and then actual uh, intervention in um, SGM-related bias. Uh, we know from our pilot study that when players report that they saw their coach intervene, they were more likely to intervene. So that systems level and, and having that culture of intervention uh, is critical. And so we have targeted our intervention that we developed uh, that we will uh, roll out starting uh, actually late this spring somehow um, at all levels. Uh, so the players uh, at this university, not this university, the university where we're testing it, uh, this intervention will receive the intervention, the coaches, all of the athletic staff, any support staff, uh, physicians, for example, athletic trainers will all receive this intervention. Uh, that we hope then will lead to more intent and then actual intervention and bias. Uh, so stay tuned for those <laughs> results. That's probably my oh, timer. Nice. <laughs> um, so it's not possible without my team. Uh, and I just want to note that this is in the context of a moment in history where 13 states are proposing anti-LGBTQ legislation that would actually ban transgender kids from participating in sports. Um, so it's critical that we understand how to. Thank I don't know how I'm going to get through all this, but let's see. Okay, I'm Katie. Uh, so glad you all are here and hearing about everybody's research in, in one space is really exciting. So <clears throat> my work, uh, I consider myself a stress process researcher, so I'm interested in how environmental experiences impact well-being. My work focuses on adolescents and specifically Latinx adolescents, and more specifically, I focus most of my work on Mexican origin youth. My work looks at um, different aspects or different sources of stress. So the first most prevalent uh, or the most common stressor that I, my work has looked at and the most, one of the most salient stressors for youth of color and Latinx, uh, Mexican origin youth is discrimination, ethnic discrimination. We know and from some of my work and others in the room here that nearly 70 to 75 percent of youth report um, at least one experience of ethnic discrimination in a year. And that's probably on the real work, at least one experience. It's a really common experience as youth. And my work has looked at how those impact um, depression, self-esteem, social integration, and physical health. I've also looked at acculturative stress and enculturative stress. So these are stressors that emerge during um, cultural adaptation. So acculturative stress refers to stressors that are experienced when you're adapting to the mainstream culture. So for an immigrant youth, this may be a stress of learning English, the stress of kind of figuring out the cultural norms within you in a school setting. And enculturative stressors are stressors that are encountered or felt when um, you're uh, retaining or adapting to your uh, culture of origin. So this could be for a later generation youth who may not speak Spanish, but in a context where Spanish is spoken. So I've looked at these uh, kind of throughout my work and how they impact you. I've also considered, so stress researchers are interested, also interested in how process, be, how this process may be moderated or what are the factors that may mitigate the impact of stress. So my work has looked at families and values ethnic identity and bicultural orientation. In addition, stress researchers are interested in mediating processes. So how stress, when you experience a stressor, how it impacts you, um, maybe physiologically, some of your behaviors, and then, in, and then eventually your well-being. So most of my work has focused on uh, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, the stress response, and also sleep behaviors. So I didn't warn you all, but I have some uh, quizzes coming throughout the slide. I think I had a last year, even that may know some of the answers. So just really quickly, the HPA axis. This is um, a complex, kind of stated simply, when we encounter a stressor, when you have to stand up and talk, your HPA axis goes through cascading uh, events, starting in the hypothalamus, um, then going to the pituitary gland, adrenal gland, and then eventually resulting in the release of cortisol into the bloodstream. Cortisol is a good thing. It helps us um, adapt and encounter the stress in our body to maintain, um, go back to maintain human effective state. So first question, three minutes. Okay, <laughs> high 
high levels of cortisol are A, always bad, always good, bad in the morning, bad in the evening. A, A, anybody A? B, C, D, E. All right, here's the answer. So in addition to this acute response, we all have this diurnal pattern of cortisol that we exhibit across the day. We wake up with high levels. We peak 30 minutes after waking, probably right when, well, that's after I've had my third cup of coffee. And then we decline across the day, reaching our lowest point around bedtime. So this is the diurnal pattern. Generally, this is a healthy, we, cortisol researchers are really interested in the slope. This is the rate of decline across the day. This is a healthy pattern. So you can see that, right, not only, it's not just high levels are bad, um, but high, well, let me get to this point. So what we know is that the flattening of the slope has been linked to chronic stress and physical and mental health problems. So it's this low levels in the morning when you should be high and higher levels in the evening when you should be low. So if you answered, what was that, D? D, that was right. So um, generally, that's what we're interested in. Also, there's all kinds of, of other parameters. If you read the cortisol literature, there's all kinds of things. But we're interested in the cortisol waking response, which is that jump in the morning, but also the area under the curve. So here's your second question. Which component of the diurnal pattern may help you cope with your day? Slope, AUC, CAR, or all of the above? The right answer is C, so it's the cortisol awakening response. We actually think that that has a capacity to help you. It gives almost like a boost throughout your day. So research has shown that when you wake up, that there was uh, research with dancers. So on days of competition, when they had a competition, they would wake up with a greater CAR. And this was their body's way of preparing them for a stressful day. All right, so last question. What U.S. city is this? Yes. Chicago. And this is of significance because most of my training with saliva and cortisol was done at, the, at Northwestern University. One minute. All right, so I just wanted to give some brief kind of overview of some of the work I have been doing. So this is a study that I did at Missouri when I was there, um, looking at African American Latinx uh, college students attending the University of Missouri, where we were looking at microaggressions and how that impacted diurnal cortisol. And we found that microaggressions, although some may view them as more subtle, these were really impactful on physiological responses. The second um, study I wanted to highlight was a study that colleagues and I did, and Russ was part of this, uh, during the election, so the US. Uh, 2015 U.S. presidential election, where we assessed stress hormones two days before the election, election day, and two days after. You can imagine what we found, um, that people were surprised by the election and stressed out. We found that women were more likely to have a physiological response um, on election night, and actually our white participants reported a stronger physiological response and more surprised from the election than our participants of color. And then finally, we had a, a, another study that uh, we did with Latinx adolescents of mostly immigrant background. Are we done with my time? Are we okay? Uh, where we found that although youth may not be voting in elections, they were still impacted by the election and thinking about the stress around the election. Just wanted to highlight a current project. So we're out, we've been recently funded by NSF, the EGLES project, which is a uh, just starting underway. We're looking at 250 Mexican. Um, origin families in the Tucson community. We're interested in understanding boys, Mexican origin boys' experiences, and how puberty shapes the context in which they, they live. I just wanted to highlight, I wanted to highlight my two graduate students here, Evelyn and Helena, who have been instrumental in getting this project off the ground. Oh, just in case you're not interested in stress, I teach these classes, and I'm very passionate about moderation and mediation, as well as research methods, so that's a plug. <laughs> oh, okay. Hi, I'm Mindy Eastman, and today I'm going to talk about the two current projects that I have ongoing. Um, so, the first one, well, the two projects that I'm currently working on is the Alcanza project. The Alcanza project is a longitudinal explanatory sequential mixed method study. This was a study with, in which the data was collected in Texas. Then um, I also am currently working on Proyecto Voces or the Voices Project. Um, the Voices Project is a cross-sectional exploratory sequential mixed method study. And that data is uh, collected here in Idaho. So, this body of work is guided by strength-based perspectives, cultural ecological models, 
and developmental planning. So beginning first with the Alcanza project, uh, this work, we, in this work we recognize STEM fields have been projected to grow with more than 9 million occupations between 2012 and 2022. And we also recognize that there is a shortage of individuals prepared for STEM fields. And we have a key target population, the Latinx population in the U.S. This is a large and growing uh, proportion of students within U.S. public schools. And, um, and they are underrepresented in with among those that have some credentials. And, um, and so they are the population to target for the increasing demands um, of STEM fields. So the first or one of the goals with the Alcanza project was to quantitatively and qualitatively examine math and science academic identities. And another goal was to examine the role of academic identity in relation to sources of academic support academic socialization, school belonging, and academic achievement. So for this study, we conducted telephone and focus group interviews with teens and their parents. And here I'm providing just a sample of these findings due to my limited time. So um, this, these were from the focus groups. We had 10 themes emerge from the focus group data. Taking here the four examples, I got quotes for you. I know we don't have a whole lot of time to read through. One of the themes was quality of the learner, to give you an example. Um, these were individual perceptions of important qualities or skills that a stu student perceived they needed in order to be successful in math and or science. And one of the quotes here is, that's something that I can explain well. All right, so turning now to Proyecto Voces, or the Voices Project. This is a, a study that examines something we're calling for now sociocultural school climate. Um, this is something that, uh, this is a study that my collabor collaborator Rajni Nair at ASU and I um, decided that we wanted to take a school level approach to address academic inequality. So what can schools do to address this inequality that's happening in schools? So um, to do, the primary goal of this study was to explore how Latino youth and parents define climate to inform the definition, the articulation, and the validation of a new measure um, of school climate for Latinx youth. So for this study, we conducted focus group interviews, and we also had teens and parents complete online surveys. And again, that data was collected here in Arizona. The previous study data was collected in Texas. So for, again, some sample findings here on where we are with, these, with this project, um, we had, two overarching themes emerge. One was a sociocultural element, the other one was a relational element, but we had key, five key sub-themes, overt racism, microaggressions or subtle racism, cultural relevance and diversity. And then in terms of the relational theme, we had autonomy needs and interpersonal support. So here's a sample quote from the overt racism um, in the sociocultural theme. Um, I know some of you have heard this one before, but here's one coming from a middle school student. We were all, every time we tried to move, like like my, my skin color tried moving with a different skin color, she was like, no, you guys don't belong together. And she would move me back. So there was this section, this section, and this section. And then there were like, then one of the students asked her, are you like a racist? Like, do you have a problem with us? Skin colors to skin colors? And she was like, yes, I don't want them together. So this is one of those sample quotes from those focus group interviews that we had. So we, we analyzed all of that focus group data. We created items for this new measure. And here's a sample of those items. So looking at the first one here that directly relates to the previous quote, we had at my school, students with darker skin color are treated differently than students with lighter skin. So this is, of course, just a sample of many items. We were wondering the other day, why did we so with so many items, <laughs> but um, anyways, we have a lot of items. So for, um, we literally collected the data, finished collecting the data at the end of fall semester. And um, we have a data manager at University of Nebraska Lincoln who's been cleaning our data. So it's not all cleaned, but to run some preliminary tests, we she did clean this particular measure for us. And so from the preliminary EFA results, two overarching factors emerged. 
One was specific to racism and the other one was cultural relevance diversity. So I don't know if you recall from that previous slide, we had those microaggressions. They didn't um, come out into their own factor. Um, they hung with those racism items. So that's an important takeaway here. All right, so that's the overview of the two projects. I already got my, my signal here. So I want you to know that I also teach uh, or have taught a special topics course on Latinx youth and families, if you're interested in hopefully um, we sign you up to teach that again. Um, I've taught research methods. I'm currently teaching mixed methods. And I also teach human development theories. These are the graduate courses. So that's all I've got for you. Here's some fancy. <laughs> So I'm going to start with really the primary research motivation. What, what keeps me up at night or gets me up in the morning, depending on how you look at it, is the idea that poverty is a developmental toxic. It's essentially a biohazard. And that all of the poverty is related to all of the bad things we don't want to have happen to us. And poverty is not randomly distributed in our society. First of all, we know ch children overall, about 20% of children ages zero to three are living in poverty. If you looked at some of Michelle Walsh's slides, you saw that Arizona, those rates are even higher. And in particular, children of color are disproportionately likely to be growing up in families experiencing poverty. So this is sort of a call to action for me. Um, because it's not all doom and gloom, though. We also know that participating in supportive early relationships actually creates foundations for healthy brain development that then resonate potentially across the and in fact, we know these supportive interactions may be most critical and yet most threatened for children who are exposed to poverty and other stressors. So what we have basically is an opportunity gap, a gap in opportunities to participate in these relationships that lead to what we later think of as developmental disparities. So the motivation here then is what can we do early on in life? Because again, we know many young children from disadvantaged backgrounds actually thrive. So think about the, the figure that uh, Russ actually showed, this idea of, well, what can we do to get more children onto those resilient curves, those curves that, that thrive? The, and not thinking about there's something magic or amazing, supernatural powers about those children and families. I like to use the term from Ann Maston, that they've had an opportunity for this ordinary magic. These ordinary, across all human populations, we see the positive effects of these supportive, caring, early relationships. So really the goal of my research is to find that magic. What is it about it? How can we identify child, family, and community strengths that support this resilience and then spread the magic? How can we spread it to other um, children and families? And some of the key contexts I consider then are family and household structure, culture, what this looks like in rural and urban settings, and early childhood education settings. We know that children benefit from multiple and consistent supportive interactions. So really thinking about how multiple caregivers are working together to support children's development. And in my work, I, I consider mothers. Um, I also look at the father-child relationships, including um, fathers who are living with their children or not living with their children, um, or grandmothers, as well as early childhood education. And today I'm gonna to focus on projects with those last two um, sets of, of caregivers. One, um, we know that <coughs> parents often play key supportive roles for parents and grandchildren. Many people anecdotally talk about their role with their grandparents. And we know this may particularly be true in economically disadvantaged communities. But this involvement by grandparents may bring both multi-generational advantages and disadvantages. And yet despite sort of evidence that grandparents are involved, we actually, and I, I've been saying this for 12 years, it still seems to be the case. We don't have a good sense of A, what influences the quality of grandparent-grandchild interactions, and B, more importantly, how the quality of those interactions is related to child development and to, to the well-being of the older generations as well. So working with some colleagues um, and sort of early work in this, is we have an online national survey of grandparents. About a quarter of them are custodial, meaning they are caring for their grandchildren without the middle parent generation. Um, I would love to present you some data here, but our data are confusing. We have um, counterintuitive findings. That's really sort of fur further uh, motivating us to really use this as pilot data to go for a larger study where we can collect more in-depth data directly from grandparents. 
but there are there are a lot of possibilities here and lots of opportunities for graduate students who might be interested to look into that. So mm -hmm. loved it. Um, the other again the other area I'm going to talk about today is, is so I work looking at early childhood education and that we know the quality of relationships that young children have with those teachers can lead to positive development. And this may be particularly important for children whose parents are unable to engage in these supportive relationships at home. We, I'm working on one project right now, a funded secondary data analysis project. Where we're really looking at sort of two levels of thinking about this relationship quality. And the first one is the, the classroom level. So overall, in general, how good are the teachers at engaging in these supportive relationships with kids? But that might not actually tell us much about the individual experiences that this particular child is having in that classroom. And so we're really trying to tease apart what the combination of those um, classroom level and individual experiences might mean for, for increases in children's school readiness skills among a Head Start population. We also, another area of work um, in, in um, early childhood education is then bringing together, thinking about the kinds of relationships kids are having at home, the kinds of relationships they're having in the classroom, and how teachers um, and um, early child care <coughs> providers can work with parents to engage parents in their children's education, both at home and in the preschool setting. With some nationally representative data, we've shown that when um, early childhood providers are working carefully with families, we do see some increases in how much um, home learning parents are doing things like reading books, and we see the strongest influences on lower income families, but not so much for increasing the quality of those interactions. And it's the quality of the interactions that are most predictive of um, school readiness and where we see the biggest economic, socioeconomic gap. Um, so, that, so a key piece, here is, piece here is figuring out, well, how can we leverage that to quality? And then again, really understanding how do we build both relationships across these two caregiving um, settings, how do we bolster the quality of these settings, and most of this work has focused on mothers and children and caregivers of children. What about the other important caregivers? So really thinking about what does it mean for children to have these supported relationships with their fathers, with, with their mothers, with their grandparents, and then with their teachers as well. How does this ultimately build towards closing that opportunity gap early in life? for showing me how to use it. Thank you. Okay, so I'm the last person. Is Kate Spears here? No. Okay. Can I ask folks to stand up and stretch for one minute? Because don't you feel like you're tired? This is what I have my students do. So stand up and stretch with me. Great news. Thank you. Yeah, so five minutes. Yeah, so, so stay, so on, stand stretching for a minute so you can stretch and move. Yeah, this is good. Now you know how the undergrads feel, right? Okay. So thanks so much. So I'm Melissa Kerr. I'm the last presenter because Kate's not here. Um, and so here are my research interests. So most generally, I'm really interested in couple family relationships. Um, more specifically, the transition of parenthood, finances and relationships, which I'll talk about, relational sacrifices, and then cancer and family systems. A great, um, we have a great project named Una Plaza para la Familia, Hardware and Grace for the Family, but I'm not going to Okay, so, because I've read this. So let's talk about number one, transition of parenthood for couples and families. So I love this data set so much. You've heard me talk about this. Like, you'll see wow in each of my slides, because I think all of these data that we have access to are amazing. So this is a, a collaboration with Melissa Barnett. So we wrote a secondary data analysis that, grant, you know, that got funded to look at building strong families. So there's 5,000 couples at baseline, y'all. 10,000 people, it's amazing, right? They're mostly lower income, all were unmarried, all were expecting their first child together. They have three times of measurement. They have really super interesting couple level measurements, things like support and affection, conflict, IP, which is intimate partner violence, infidelity. We've had great output from this data set. So um, Elena, who was uh, Melissa's student, Shannon Warren, who was here, Alexandria, who was just here, Alexa, who's in clinical psychology, have used these for their CCC data set. It's a great set of data set to apply person-centered analyses. Elena has a great first author publication, Journal of Family uh, Psychology. Shami has a great first author publication, Journal of Family Psychology. Shannon just has a new paper, right, from your thesis, if I remember correctly. It's also a great data set to use to compare to other data sets. So Ashley LeBaron has a first author publication about relational bone, uh, bone adaptation in different journals. Love this data set. Just so many different things you can use. And 5,000 couples, y'all. You know I love that. I'm just so excited about that. Next. And there's also this great A plus data set, which started here, which is so exciting. We have such Arizona pride. So this is the Arizona Pathway to Life Success for University Students, or A+. Um, it was focused on, um, it's 
if we were looking at romantic relationships, we have eight years of data on about 800 young adults um, transitioning to adulthood. You know I'm excited about that. So they're about 18 to 26. We have super interesting financial questions that Noah would be interested in, that Heather would be interested in. Things like student debt and loans, financial social experience, romantic partner, your own young adult money management. We have great questions about relationship and satisfaction and commitment, attachment styles. We also have had great output from here. Um, Shemi has a great first author publication at Journal of Adult and Developmental Psychology. It's a great use of longitudinal data. I'll show you a figure. And then she has another publication at Journal of Family and Economic Issues about attachment. Y'all, look at this figure. Do I understand what happened analytically? No, I do not. <laughs> but do I understand this is a great way to model and use longitudinal data that Xiaomi can do? Yes. Like, I love this, right? I love this. Like, I love this paper. It's so cool because you can look at stuff over time. You can look at direct effects, indirect effects. You can look at things specific to here. You can look at more indirect effects. I just love it. And then here's another one. So, you know, Xiaomi has a lot of free time, right? And so she's like, here's my new model that I put together over the weekend. So this is in progress work by Xiaomi, which is just also so interesting. So again, continuing to look at things like finances, financial satisfaction, and then what's going on developmentally, at, you know, multiple, multiple eight years later. Oh my gosh, just love these data so much. So, and then say you're like, oh, are there other financial sources we can look at? Yes. So there's the Korean data that I just learned about and which I also love. It also got a wow. So Heather and Ashley are gonna know much more about this than me, but it's a nationally representative survey of newly married young couples, almost 1900 couples, nationally representative. And there's data from both partners. You know, I love this. And so we have an in-prep project with Melissa, Heather, who hopefully will come to the UK to continue to work with us. <laughs> That's why they're smiling. Shami and Ashley, Alexa, and then Aaron Hughes, who I actually went to graduate school with. So it's very nice to have these great connections come together. And then say so you're like, oh, there's new data I want to collect. I'm not really impressed by your 10,000 people. Like I want something else. Fine, great. So we have a Chris Sebrin technique that has been super successful. So we've asked undergraduate students and their partners to take a survey. Like we have great di daily diaries or have them have their friends, roommates, parents offer extra credit. So this is virtually free and we can get couple and daily diary data and we publish in really, 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 really excellent journals. So we are really, really appreciative for this procedure. Okay, that's the end. Thank you. <laughs>